Today we will be exploring the topic of self-regulation. As early childhood professionals, what do we need to know about self-regulation and why is it important? How can we be intentional about our own interactions with children in order to support their ability to self-regulate? We had the opportunity to sit down with Jill Moley, a Loving Guidance Associate who provides workshops all over the country to early childhood professionals and families on how to implement conscious discipline. If you are not familiar with conscious discipline, it is a comprehensive approach developed by Dr. Becky Bailey that integrates social-emotional learning, discipline, and self-regulation. A major focus of the program is supporting the emotional intelligence of both the adults and the children in the classroom. Conscious Discipline provides research-based strategies to help educators teach critical life skills through their daily interactions with children. In our interview, Jill discusses the importance of shifting our thinking about discipline in order to promote self-regulation skills in young children. She also emphasizes the importance of being intentional about teaching social-emotional skills, just as we are very intentional about teaching math and literacy skills. Throughout the video, you will also hear from two teachers at Carlinville Intermediate School who have been implementing conscious discipline in their preschool classrooms. They will speak about their first-hand experiences with using these strategies to support the children and the families that they work with. Let's begin with Jill as she defines self-regulation and discusses the importance of teaching these essential skills during early childhood. So what is self-regulation? Self-regulation is the ability to manage three things, really. First, your thoughts, and those thoughts then direct feelings, and then those feelings turn into actions. And so being able to regulate your thoughts, your feelings, your actions in service of a goal. So really what you want to be able to do is manage your inner state enough that you can learn something new. How do you develop self-regulation with early childhood kids? Um, and oftentimes our focus in the past has been on getting them to stop a behavior. So we've confused self-regulation with just getting them to look nice and look polite. Um, and so we're really focusing on shifting from getting to giving them an example to learn from. So, so in Conscious Discipline, we teach adults to learn to self-regulate themselves, and then they model those skills, and then have a willingness, instead of um, punishing children when they have upset, they actually teach and identify that child is laying on the floor because he's frustrated and he didn't know how to handle that feeling of frustration. When you're looking at preschool children, how do you build self-regulation? What would that look like in a classroom, in a, in a home? And self-regulation in small children, what we love and what we see, as we begin to teach skills, it comes out in many forms. So there are often times that we see a friend offering self-regulation to an upset friend. So they may be sitting in circle and they, the friend reaches over and takes the child's hand and takes a breath. When a child doesn't have a skill to identify upset, but in fact, typically they believe just stop and so they look at them and they, are, they say stop, stop, stop. So if they don't have self-regulation and they haven't um, seen adults model that, then oftentimes they don't offer a skill to a child, they just ask them to stop as well. Um, so that's one case. Uh, another thing that we often see children do is they have a conscious awareness that this state of upset doesn't have to be here. I'm not bad because I have it, there's nothing wrong that I have it, but there is a place in my classroom that I won't be in trouble if I go. It's not a timeout. It's a place called a safe place. And in that safe place is where children go and they are taught that in this place there are tools that you can use to manage and to regulate those big feelings that kind of, and, and sometimes the way we explain it to kids is it's kind of like a storm. When those feelings come, it's like sometimes very predictable. You know, if you don't get your spot in line, 
this is the day I'm gonna have a storm. I'm gonna have a storm because of this. But there are days when you have pop-up showers and all of a sudden, you don't even know why you had this big storm. And the great piece of the safe place is, children can take themselves there, a friend can take them there, or a teacher can invite them. And how do emotions impact self-regulation? And one of the bigger things is, self-regulation is about a consciousness. What we've been taught is to just be quiet and, and not be quiet and listen, because if we were teaching children to be quiet and be present with what's happening inside of them, completely different message. But we say, stop, don't have that anymore. And, and truthfully, what happens is, how emotions tie to self-regulation is, we have thoughts inside our head, and those thoughts can sometimes ruminate. And if we don't grab a hold of them, or if we're not conscious that we're even having those thoughts, those thoughts trigger an emotion inside of us. And when we have that emotion, we act a certain way. So if we have a conscious awareness of our thoughts, and we teach children to say things like, when a child is having an upset, and their hands are like this and their face is like this, instead of saying, don't you start, which is what many folks would say to that child, we would say, we would give them the words for the thoughts inside their head. It would sound something like, well, your eyebrows are going like this and your hands are like this. Your body's telling me that you're feeling angry. That labels that feeling and that emotion for the child. And it's so much easier to manage if you're allowed to have it. But for a lot of children, they're not allowed to have the emotion. Therefore, they lack what people call self-control, what we call self-regulation. They lack that because if they're never allowed to feel angry, they're never, you're okay, you're okay, mommy will be back, or we give them a toy. If we're never allowed to feel the emotion, we can never regulate it. I guess the, the biggest benefit of conscious discipline is the kids learning these self-regulation skills. It's all the things that you put in place um, to make that happen. They really get a sense of belonging. The school family is such a wonderful concept. And by the end of the year, you can see the kids kind of using these systems on their own. They can take themselves to the safe place. They can express to an adult why one child is acting one way and another child isn't. The changes that we have made have impacted the children in helping them with their independence. Um, they're able to recognize their own emotions and then help regulate those skills on their own as well as resolving some conflicts with their peers. They're not having to seek out the teachers as often as they would if they didn't have these skills in place. Um, when working in an inclusive classroom, when using conscious discipline, I th there are a number of benefits that go along with that. You know, you have students who are nonverbal or who are just learning to speak. And the strategies and the structures that conscious discipline gives, it helps those students have words and it helps the students who are typically developing be able to communicate their thoughts and their feelings with those kids with special needs. So it helps not only typically developing kids, but they are able to form more of a family and they are able to build upon each other. An example of this, I can think of a situation where I had a student with a disability who knew that it was time um, to line up to make our transition to go to the bathroom and he was standing in front of the door, um, was not able to stand on the spots where all the kids line up and was just kind of waiting and being a little noisy and we had a substitute in the room who was trying to move him to the spot and move him to the spot and he wasn't going to do it because he knew that he was waiting to go to the bathroom and that was his, that was his job. Our line leader was standing there, a three-year-old I believe at the time, and was able to say to the stub, or to the sub, it's okay, he's still learning, he knows we're going to go potty, he can stand here if he wants to. You know, and that's just a miraculous thing for them to be able to express that. They know that we're all working on different things, we're, you know, we're not all at the same place at the same time. He, his self-regulation skill at the moment was he knew he needed to be by the door because we were going to leave, and the other little boy was able to express that it's okay, he doesn't have to stand on the spot because this is where he's at right now, which is amazing. So how do early childhood folks 
have the ability through their interactions to teach self-regulation. And really that's a huge one. And the biggest piece would be for us to open our hearts um, and be willing to look at some of the external things that we do to try to regulate children. So as a, um, a school population and a school community, what we have done in the past to regulate children's emotions is we've bribed them with candy, treasures, um, smiley faces and frown faces. Um, we've used a little fear or a lot of fear. Um, and, and we've said that they're not going to be able to play with friends, that they'll have to sit out of the circle with all of the best intentions. All those external pieces that we used were not in an effort to be hurtful to children ever. The early childhood education um, population has always had the best intentions, just not the best tools. And so the great piece of conscious discipline is it gives you some new tools and it allows you to walk away from those external pieces. And so you walk away from all the things that are on the board. You walk away from the stoplights and, and the whistles and the, um, the treasure chests. And you walk into what we're really good at. We're wonderful at teaching. We teach math well, we teach colors beautifully, we understand when a child doesn't know their first letter that we have to sing it and eat it and dance it and do it in many different venues. We have to teach that in so many different ways. But when it comes to self-regulation, it's not been in our wheelhouse to use a lot of teaching strategies. It's just been ingrained in our old ways to simply punish children or to bribe them. So self-regulation through interaction is teaching and modeling and letting go of some of those things that we've used in the past. How do teachers build into their environment um, self-regulation? And certainly having a safe place we have found is not the only, the end all be all. In fact, in, in many classrooms, homes that we've worked with, it begins as a decoration because the philosophy and the premise is so much deeper than go sit over there for a second and collect yourself. It, it's a lot deeper than that. And so how does a teacher change the environment so the safe place is actually successful? And the first thing that we know is the teacher's ability to see the conflict as an opportunity to teach instead of as being threatened by the child having more power or by the child being so hurtful to other children. So the first thing that we have to do is, in some sense I say, not let go of everything that we've done, but are we willing to add some pieces to our environment? For example, we used to focus a lot on where should you be sitting really makes me sad. We used to focus a lot on what's not happening in the classroom. What if we gave half of our attention to what is happening well? So we would begin to notice helpfulness. We would say things like, well, you scooted over so your friend would have space. That was helpful. You opened the door so your friends could walk through. Way to go. So we would begin to notice that. And in noticing that, of course, what you begin to focus on, you get more of. And so now all of a sudden, you have four-year-old children going, he gave her a pencil. She could now write. And so now all of a sudden they have excitement about sharing with you the kindness as opposed to coming to you and saying, she didn't clean up. She was supposed to be there and she butted in line somewhere else. They report to us what we look for. And so the way we see children and the way we see conflict is the way they see conflict. So when we begin to see the behavior as a call for help, all of a sudden now, children believe their job isn't to judge other children in the classroom who are struggling. Their job now is to help them be successful. And there's a big philosophical switch in a classroom when children stop judging and feeling like it's their job to blame others and that's what teachers are looking for. They want compassionate classrooms back. They want children to do things because it's just the right thing inside. But we don't know how to achieve that. And the way we start achieving that is we build a school family. And so in a school family, um, everybody counts. And everybody has a job. 
And so the way that the safe place is successful isn't by looking at a picture, watching a video, and saying, oh, I need these items and this sign. But in truth, it really is about building a space that is safe enough that children feel like they won't be judged if they go to that space by their peers, by the adults in the classroom. In fact, they're encouraged and invited, and those are done through many structures that we create, the Safe Place, um, the Friends and Family Board, um, the Kindness Tree. So there are lots of structures that we build into that environment so that self-regulation can take place when children go to the Safe Place. When implementing conscious discipline, a lot of people think you need to make a lot of changes to your environment, but actually a lot of the things that Dr. Becky Bailey talks about are things that are best practice in early childhood. So we did use the structures, but we didn't really have to make a lot of changes to our environment. Some of the changes that we've made to help foster self-regulation skills in our classroom with conscious discipline are we've just implemented a variety of different structures, you know, the safe place, the wish well, um, the caregiver box. You know, not all of those were in place when I had originally started in the district, but we have slowly added things to help the kids become more independent. There are five essential steps that we teach children when they go to the safe place, um, and those five steps are I am, I calm, I feel, I choose, and I solve. And in a nutshell, what that looks like is a circle. And so envision a circle in your head, a clock. And so at 12 o'clock is I am. And I am is about I am triggered. I am angry right now. I am in this state of upset and there's nothing wrong with that. That's where I am. What we move to around three o'clock, if you're following that clock image in your head, is that I calm state. A place where we misled folks in the beginning when we began these five steps of self-regulation was, we didn't clearly teach that I calm doesn't mean you become Zen and yoga and you relax 100%. In the ICOM, at that three o'clock space in your brain, that's three deep breaths. All that you're doing in the ICOM is calming the thoughts enough in your head so that you can feel the feeling. So often what happens is we just think and think and think and get angrier and angrier and angrier and angrier and we don't ever allow those thoughts to calm enough that you can feel that upset because the when you feel it in your body uh, your neck gets tight your um, hands start to clench when you begin to notice and aware that uh, and become aware of that all of a sudden um, some feelings begin to bubble up when feelings bubble up to your executive state or your thinking state now you have the ability to truly choose how could I help myself feel differently? How could I reframe what I saw? What I was hearing in my head was, they knew exactly what they were doing. How many times have I talked to them about this? It's February, they should know better. So that's what happens when you're in that I am state. When you allow yourself to feel the disappointment. So perhaps for you, um, it wasn't anger at all. You're feeling disappointed that you had a plan for what you were doing during circle, and now the plan's been foiled. If you can feel disappointment, then when you get to the I choose, you make a healthier choice as opposed to reverting back to default patterns, where you default to just taking a kid out of the um, circle or, or doing something um, in a very reactive phase. This allows you to truly reflect, choose what path am I going to go and then truly solve that problem. And oftentimes what you find out is when you go through these five steps, the root of what you really believed you were upset about has completely changed. Um, and that's because of that conscious awareness. Children do this very naturally. The person that these five steps are hard for are the adults. So for teachers, um, 
we sometimes try to micromanage those steps. Um, but when you see a child, they typically can walk through those steps very easily um, because they don't get stuck in judgment. We typically get stuck kind of between that I calm and I feel where, well, you know, they should be doing this and I should be getting some help with this. And when we get stuck in that, we create our solution based on what we believe we should have versus based on what's really experiencing or what's really happening in that environment. Feelings deserve to be navigated. And the safe place is an area to navigate upset, um, sadness, anger, frustration. So after they've experienced through a physical means in the safe place, physically feeling um, safe by going through and, and um, during the feelings, talking to that buddy, um, feeling buddy and saying, your eyes are going like this and your face is going like this. It's teaching them this conscious awareness. So the whole idea is, then when they're sitting at the carpet, they can start a notice. My hands are going like this and my arms are like this. I'm feeling disappointed. And then from there, they can visualize what happens in the safe place. And what we find for a lot of kids is they don't have to even go eventually to that safe place because it becomes an inner space. And now we are finding that lots more folks are finding success because they're, they're walking through that. And the fringe benefit is when a teacher walks a child through those five steps, they're also practicing those within themselves. Teacher states um, have a huge impact on children's self-regulation. So as a teacher begins to be frustrated in the classroom, which is natural, we would expect that teachers aren't going to walk around home, you know, all day long. That's just not realistic. Um, so the goal in conscious discipline is not that teachers are perfect. Instead, the goal is that we have an awareness that as my state begins to shift, and as I become frustrated, if I can begin to see children as missing skills versus doing it on purpose, when I view kids' behavior as intentional, my attention focuses and shifts towards my intention. So if my intention is he knows exactly what he's doing, I know he knows he's doing, guess what? The, what comes out of me next is a feeling like I need to punish because regulating my own thoughts, my own feelings, and my own actions in service of a goal is gonna be a powerful piece. So when a teacher sees a child push and shove another child, takes a breath, chooses to see that child is missing a skill, now all of a sudden a plethora of tools are open to that teacher. She has the ability to to get down at that child's level and, and to really grab hold of their hand and take some deep breaths with them, as opposed to gritting her teeth and trying not to say what she's really thinking inside her head. And that's not self-regulation, that's just holding it in. <laughs> and so we don't want teachers to just be polite. And I believe that that's a big shift and a big difference for a lot of folks, they believe that we need to be, you know, we don't need to let our ugly side out. And it's not about holding your ugly side in. It's truly about having an awareness and regulating that, which guides and teaches kids how, when they don't get the spot in line that they want, how do I handle that upset? Well, the same way as when I don't get to do the big book. When I wanted to teach the big book, I have to regulate that as well. We need to be aware of our own self-regulation levels. I need to know what I'm feeling on the inside um, because Dr. Becky Bailey has that saying, what you focus on, you're going to get more of. So if I'm really upset or flustered or um, feeling out of control, then the kids are going to mirror that same feeling back to me. So we have to kind of take a deep breath ourselves, be in check with our own feelings, so that way we can um, get the children to react how we want them to. It's very important for teachers to 
self-reflect on situations that have happened. You know, myself and my team are always self-reflecting after school to make plans of how we can help the kids be the most successful in the classroom. Whether it's we know these two students can't sit next to one another during circle time because they have a very difficult time keeping their hands to themselves or we know that another child has difficulty sharing um, during free choice time. So we're always making those conscious decisions and of where we're going to be and we make those decisions based on our self-reflection. Um, some of the strategies that we have used to teach our families about conscious discipline is we have meetings three times a year where we're bringing the, the families in and we are going over different things such as the structure of the brain, um, giving the choices, um, helping managing changes. So we are kind of presenting that information to them and then we problem solve. What sort of problems are they having at home? Which of these strategies would be helpful for them to use? You know, what are the students already familiar with that you know, would be easier to transfer from school to home because that school to home family relationship is very, very important. We also send home informational letters. If we're asking the parents to make something for us or come in and do something with us, we're relating it to conscious discipline. Um, in our safe place, we have all of our family pictures up. So we send a letter home saying why the school family is so important and how we want to connect our school family to the home families. And that's why we need those pictures in there. So we send a letter kind of explaining all of that. So Dr. Bailey talks about four pieces of really helping a difficult child. And the first one that she encourages early childhood educators to do when they're working with really tough kids is see that child. What does it mean to see a child? Of course you see them, they're sitting in front of you. And when we talk about seeing a child, we're talking about noticing them. So when their face looks like this and their arms are like this, out loud you would say, I can see by your face and your eyebrows are like this and your arms like this, you were hoping to have a turn first. Your body's telling me it's hard to wait. Take a breath. You got this. That's seeing the child. We have been taught planned ignoring. You know, he's just making a face right now. Don't give him any attention. Don't, don't look at him. And, and the truth is that child isn't asking for your attention. They're asking for you to help guide them with the storm. They have this storm inside themselves. They thought they wanted it their way. Seems developmentally appropriate still for them to want it their way. Um, so see the child is the first thing. The second thing would be soothe the child. What is soothing the child? How does that look different for early childhood folks? Instead of distracting children with toys, um, instead of distracting them with a center that they enjoy or a friend, instead of saying, you're okay, you're okay, you're actually going to say, breathe with me. This is hard. You've got this. <sighs> you're going to model how to regulate versus just trying to distract them from having and experiencing that feeling. So being seen, being soothed. The third one would be safety. So if a child is going to feel safe, a felt sense of safety, we're not talking about are there covers on the outlets? Do you know the fire drill? Do you have your little you know, kit with you? We're talking about creating an environment in the classroom where children believe that they can come in with who they are. Um, and that means come in with the troubles that, that they've been given um, because of their environment that they live in and that we're going to give them tools to navigate um, the struggles that they have. So, so feeling safe in the environment and, and really creating and building that school family so being seen, being soothed, feeling safe, and the last one um, is being stimulated. We stimulate children academically all the time. We see that as very valuable. In fact, we feel like that's very important. Um, we don't place the same value in stimulating children's self-regulation. 
How do you stimulate their self-regulation? Through face-to-face -face interactions. So that face-to-face -face stimulation that you do with a child literally wires their brain to help them self-regulate and have impulse control and to help them be willing to listen to the words that you say. So being seen, being soothed, feeling safe, and stimulating are the four S's that Dr. Bailey really believes are um, the answer to helping difficult children navigate um, the road that they're on. We hope that this video provided you with a comprehensive overview that addressed the what, the why, and the how questions that you might have had regarding self-regulation in early childhood. We also hope that it encouraged you to reflect on some important questions regarding your own interactions with children. We have included a list of questions for your consideration in your handouts. Our hope is that you embrace the philosophy that it's just as important for us as adults to focus on our own emotional intelligence and our own ability to self-regulate so that we can slow down and take the time to model and to teach children the social-emotional skills they will need to be successful in life. If we can create a safe environment, connect with children, and help guide them through strong emotions and conflict situations, then we are helping them to wire their brains in ways that will promote success well beyond the early childhood years. Thank you for joining us.